Rebecca Hart for inviting us to contribute to this series of evening talks and lectures associated with the exhibition you see around you. These wonderful historic photographs of um, strong, independent women who contributed to the foundation of our republic. Um, the farm gate is one of the very few business, um, businesses in town who understand uh, maybe the, the, the advantages of associating themselves with, with the arts and with culture. And um, right from the beginning, uh, the farm gate has uh, placed sculpture and fine paintings um, on the walls around realizing that an artistic ambiance attracts custom and uh, their commitment to the literary life of the city is in evidence with the poetry wall they have in the back room here and they also very kindly sponsor uh, a weekly poem in the Irish Tower. Um, so tonight we have Dernie Griffith who has written a uh, short story uh, especially for my mission, uh, this story was inspired by this exhibition and by, by these women. Um, Dylan is better known as a poet who writes both in Irish and English. Uh, she has published two books, uh, Oscar uh, and a collection in English called Trasp. Uh, she's won the Wigtown Poetry Prize for uh, Poem Gaelic. Uh, she has received the bursary of the Ireland Chair of Poetry. And just this week, she was given the most prestigious award a young Irish writer can receive the, the Rooney Prize. Uh, so, uh, so, I'd like to hand over now to. Thanks very much, Pat, and thanks everyone for being here. It's so lovely to see such a big crowd. Farming is a lovely venue for this kind of an event. Um, and actually, farming, yeah. they really are champions of literature and great faith in the writers. Um, I'm delighted to receive this commission, and especially the poet, to be asked and to kind of be challenged and pushed a little, and to be asked to write a piece of fiction is really interesting for me. Um, Centenary year, I suppose, we've all been looking towards the past and, and trying to honour how that sense of the past still pulses in our present. And the Farm Gate Cafe have been amazing, I think we can all acknowledge in this respect. Uh, this series of events, the Women of the South, has just been so inspiring for me and so many others. Um, and please, uh, I want to thank you for just your extraordinary vision. It's been amazing. And a lot of our lives just as writers are solitary. And I just want to say to other quick things before I start. And we do all of our work pretty much sitting alone in a room and we're very lucky when we have friendships in writing. And the story that I want to read with tonight is only been read by two other people who were very kind to read it and very encouraging and they're my friends and we read and I don't know if they're here but if they are, thank you very much for your friendship and your support. And I wanted this to be a Cork story, so it's based in the old Cork library and when I was researching it I used Helen Donegan's pieces on the ladies reading rooms a lot so uh, I would say to gratitude to the library and to Helen, and I always want to thank Pat and Jen the Conservation Centre because they're just wonderful. And this is just the start of so many brilliant events now today, and we're looking forward to it. And the story is that I've spent ages mulling over what to write about. I mean, if you turn and if you look around you here, I really do turn it around with the picture. I mean, if I was to ask any of you to write a story, I mean, we probably all choose different characters or uh, different plot lines to explore. And I was surprised when I started thinking about it, 
how I was drawn most not necessarily to the headline figures, but the people in the background and the kind of shadowy faces, and particularly in this image here, where there are so many shadowed faces. When I was sitting to write, um, that really stayed with me, the sense that there are always people in the background of all the headline events and all the kind of sense of public epiphanies that come with revolutionary women. So I kind of wanted to stray and support it with the usual narrative that we have of you know, or housewife of women of this era and have someone who's a bit mixed up and who doesn't feel like a main character in her own life and to, to have us witness uh, her own epiphany and revolution in revolutionary times. Um, so we always did that to happen because it's kind of a radical awakening. Uh, it's very unusual for me to sit down and tell a story apart from to my kids, so I really hope you want to like it. I'm going to bed and wash it down anyway, so I'll set it in. There we go. A stranger is staring at me. I turn and pretend to peer out the window as though concerned with the tramp that hurt to his past, with body faces behind his dirty windows, or with the beckoning storm cloud above it. Two women hurry across the street, arms linked at the elbow, hitching their skirts up from puddles and horse dirt. By the bridge, a boy picks a heaven and flings it into the river as liquid shrug and brush. The frothing surface absorbs the stone of the gull. I sneak another glance back, and yes, she's still staring at me. Everything else is as it always is here in the ladies' reading room. The air warm and lively with whisper murmurs, the swish twitch of magazine pages in Gentlewoman and Ladies Victoria, and the occasional dull thud from the general reading room. Still, from behind her glasses, she stares. She's almost familiar, about my own age, her hair a dark red, wearing a green dress. A hat lies next to her, and there's an umbrella folded at her feet. Maybe I've seen her before, but I'm sure that we've never spoken. Late afternoons such as now are quiet as here, as most of the ladies have made their way home to attend to evening duties. I have no such responsibilities. I sit with a book in my lap. I linger. I can't bring myself to look directly at the watcher, so I try to act relaxed, letting my gaze dawdle around the room while it's me back to spy on her. The library counter is unmanned. A stout woman waits there, drumming her fingertips on the counter and sighing crossly. The windows darken. Beyond the glass, a blinkered cart horse shudders and takes three skittish sideways steps, steaming flanks trembling, shoulder muscles moving like an ocean in a storm. The driver hops nimbly from his perch, bears the animal by a cheek strap, and leads him away. I glance over my shoulder. She's still peering at me. On catching my eye, her gaze darts downwards to give the impression of being engrossed in her reading. I feel myself blush, an itch tingling across my skin like a premonition. Maybe she sees through me, past the respectable clock told by my clothes of young beach wife, past the blank, pleasant face that is the only hope of a child's widower, past the dutiful smile that says, Yes, mother, if you think it's for the best, I'll marry father's friend. Perhaps this woman sees what the cat saw that I am a fraud. For months, I tried to befriend my predecessor's cat, bribing her with breakfast sausages. Tibby always grabbed the greasy meat and paddled away to gobble it in sideways mouthfuls, watching me from the corner of the green eye. Whenever I tried to play Lady of the House with her, whispering, here, kitty, here, kitty, kitty, she only glares at me licking her paws and swiping them over her face. Tibby recognised instantly that I am a fake. She shuns me. She shames me. Once I taught her, 
and forced her into my lap with heavy hands. She let me rub her fur, but she didn't fur. Instead, she watched me through cold eyes, clenching and unclenching her claws into the soft flesh of my thigh, until finally I let go, and she scampered towards the door, turning at the threshold to regard me for one slow second before stalking away. Horrible creature. Her long, unembarrassed gaze reminds me somehow of this lady who, yes, still watches me now. I pretend to glance towards the door and peep at her again. I do know her. I saw her here before. She's one of Suzanne Day's ladies. Kathleen, I think? Or Katie? I remember her putting fresh copies of books for women on the tables. When she offered me a pamphlet, I shook my head, but she pressed it into my hand, so I took it sheepishly and then threw it into a nearby bin, even though I could feel her watching me as I did it. Yes, it's the same woman, fiddling with her hat pin now, and glancing at me again. I wonder she hasn't taken off to nurse soldiers at the front along with her mistress day. No doubt she thinks of my name. Before she has a chance to hold me and to take one of her rally pamphlets again, I gather my things and leave. I'm home earlier than usual, so I sit in the front bedroom with a novel plucked from the shelf, one of my predecessors. It's only four o'clock, but storm clouds darken the city to a shadowy dusk. A log spits in the fireplace, and the room feels cozy and complete, so much so that I can almost convince myself that I belong here. Her books, still fill the shelves, all romances and happy endings. I find these stories so tiresome. I'm always distracted by imagining some minor character story, the hag to whom the heroine hands a fire or some scullery maid sighed at in exasperation. If I were a book, say, one about that Kate, that watcher, she'd be the heroine of some beautifully illustrated novel of suffrage and courage, where I'd be no more than a background silhouette in the illustration of her library scene. Someone so minor that the book's artist doesn't even bother to fill me in. An outline the shoulder, probably, at the back of the head. The book lies in my lap as I watch lamps lit in drawing rooms and kitchens all over the valley. The storm clenches its slow, black fist overhead. A first rumble of thunder could be mistaken for a cart rolling down Military Hill towards Victoria Road, but is followed by a faint flicker at the corner of my eye. I lay my brow against the window glass and wonder where my husband is, whether he too is watching the storm, whether he cares for storms at all. I've never asked him about his fondnesses, whether he prefers storm or sunshine, tea or troops, cats or dogs. Instead of asking, I imagine his preferences to distract myself with the tangled mess of questions I can't bear to ask of myself. Whether accepting the total of obedience is in fact a sensible decision, for example, or whether it's actually for her to learn to be a wife and command her household, or whether love is just another brilliant fairy tale designed to lull girls into the world of men. I try to quench these questions as soon as they start, they still, like this lightning, they flash at the boundaries of my thoughts. The second one rolls not her. I feel it build me with my breastbone, setting a sheen of goosebumps over my arms. Another flash yellow in the sky, and the whole city is transformed, eerie bright, and then flipped back to black. Hay, sudden and hard, rattles the window. I count the tiny white grits at the heart of each drop as they roll down the glass, melting as they fall. The city towers in the valley below, where I imagine the streets empty, doorways filled with men seeking shelter, colours muffling their mouths. Katie might be there, I think, strolling to rainy laneways, her hat soaked, drops running down her neck, her arms swaying freely. I see myself walking with her, as her friend. She smiles and nods as I speak, although I can't imagine what intelligent thing I might possibly say to provoke this happy response. When we approach a puddle, she slides a gloved hand over my elbow and clasps my arm lightly, our strides suddenly matching, 
our feet moving together as we cross the street. We shiver. The third rumble is a roar that jolts me back to the room and set my whole body in woman. The sound of the hail is louder now, and I realize with a cold rush by, I must have left the window of the back bedroom open this morning. In I run and see the sash still high, the sound of being amplified for so many hard drops ricochet off the frame and spit into the room. The inner sill is already dripping onto the rug where my diary sits face down and worse, much worse. In the garden below where everything is lush and green and quivering in the storm, I see something move. Something is twisting wildly from the branch of the cherry tree. A tail. I sprint down the stairs so fast that I stumble, scraping my spine up the last six steps and thumping my head hard against the banister. Tears quiver my vision as I turn the cold doorknob and run out into the garden. Water soaks through my stockings and hay stains my face. I run to the tree. Tippy. She perches on a branch just out of my reach, tails white and white, her fur drenched. She yowls long and hoarse. I call to her, rubbing wet fingers together. Oh, Tippy, oh, Tippy, here, Kitty, here, Kitty. My God, I can't let him lose her as well. The lightning again. I cry, oh, please, Tippy, please. But the cat just meows a long, mournful howl. The slits of her eyes are gorged into fat black moons. My mistress is dead, her eyes say, and I am a clever beast. I could never trust a child to save me from such horror. Thunder again. Tibby holds herself at a slant, her tail fuzzy and peculiar. I reach both my hands up over my head, stretch and wet tiptoe as high as I can and beg her, beg her. Imagine begging a cat what I do, I implore her, both of my hands stretching high, high into the black sky where enormous clouds stagger into each other and roar overhead, louder, louder than anything I've ever heard and my dress and underskirts are soaked through, my hair loose, Two feet in a deepening puddle, every inch of my skin drenched, and every tiny hair on my body quivering, and my mouth open as though in prayer. And the last words that come from my mouth into that electric air are, Oh, come to me, oh, come to me, oh, do, oh, please, and I will be better, I will, I will, I. And those are the words that bring down the light, the light. The light. It comes from the clouds. My words are an accidental invocation, maybe some secret spell to an ancient deity. But when I wake, everything is changed. Everything. Or maybe it's only I who's changed. But when I open my eyes to the world, this wet garden and the three stories of red brick rising to a vast sky, everything, everything feels changed. And I am lying on the ground, blinking at the lush opening of the world. By my eye, the puddles brimming, filling with sky water, each drop an oh, going to an oh, rippling to swelling edges, and the world all full in water, all oh, and oh, and oh, and I am full of awe. I will lie here forever, my mouth filling with the tang of rust of leaked metal. There will be nothing. To stand up for anymore, for everything is alive here and so close, all these perfect dripping holes and, 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 and something touches me, something sudden and cold against my arm, and there is Tibby, her eyes narrow slitted again, touching her cold nose to my skin, prodding me to return to the waking world, for no woman should lie in fuddles. This is not behavior that her mistress would tolerate. She pushes the side of her face against my leg, wiping her feline saliva there as though marking me and mewing, although I don't hear a sound. My ears hiss. Her open mouthed face is a question mark at the end of an animal sentence that I can't hear. 
I roll down to my side and see her tears vanish over the wall. I am alone, lying in this very garden, alone and shivering, watching all the countless grasses shivering too. Falling myself up since the whole garden spinning, but I drag myself to my bedroom, peel off the thin wet dress, I sink to hold the sheets and to dream of sleep. When I wake, the room is dark, and I am both cold and clammy, my sheets thrown aside, the drapes have not been drawn, the lamp is unlit. And seeing me so disheveled, the maid must have wanted to preserve my date. To my surprise, I don't feel my usual cringing embarrassment. Pain runs all down my arm to where my wedding ring is burned a blistering circle around my finger. Knees trembling, I move to the wardrobe and fumble in search of a nightdress. When the wardrobe door creaks open to reveal its mirrored inner gleam, I see myself skin luminous in the dark. My temple has swelled pink and tender. My cheek and neck are mud-stained. A thin red mark has webbed itself from under my ear, branching all the way down the length of my arm. It's unlike any burn I've ever seen. Blisters bloom all along its length. I lift my hand high and turn around peering at my reflection over my shoulder. The mark spreads itself way over my back to crimson, delicate and branched as the fronds of a fern. My face in the mirror is unmarked. What would my husband think if he visited my room now? He only ever visits the night so black that I can't see him, so that I can only feel him, his hands opening me at the push, the gasp, and the long warmth of his body against mine in the seconds afterwards, the hot ticklish trickle of his tears on my neck. Silence then, at the click of the door. With each month, I puzzle over what I'm doing wrong. When we married, they all watched me with such expectation, his family, his colleagues, even the servants. They watched me into summer and autumn, but I remain as skinny as ever. I haven't changed as they hoped into a plump of mother, birthing a bright future for them all to live in. My face grayed under their gaze, the pink paling from my cheeks. I felt myself relieved when they began to avert their eyes from me. Now, this strange twisting burn marks me as ugly, as ugly and as fraudulent as I truly am. And now, strangely, I no longer care. Now, in this scorch pain, I bear only lives. For days, I stay in bed, clinging the cold. I rise only to dab the translucent, fluid-filled sores that bustle around the wound. Once the blisters begin to heal, I return to my daily business, such as it is. No one asks any questions. Today, I choose this dark afternoon to button my coat and return to my seat under the library window. At one end of a long, low table, a knot of women huddle, heads close together, whispering over a copy of the illustrated London news. And at the other end, the red-haired watcher, Katie, who stared at me weeks before, engrossed now in a thick novel. I let my eye linger on her boldly daring her to look up, but she doesn't notice me. I'm almost disappointed, but why would she notice me? To the world, I'm as dull as ever. Only I know how the lightning twitches inside me now. It is impatient, this inner blaze. It demands revolution, it threatens to take over me if I don't change. Its twitch makes me long for Katie to see me again. But why? And what would I do if she did? Would I challenge her stare and her silly pamphlets? Or would the lightning ignite me to say something else entirely? Do I want to entice this stranger to become my friend or my enemy? Nearby, a lanky girl, face speckled with pimples, sits in a high back chair, staring intently at the periodical in her lap. I watch her gaze dart to the empty counter as she slowly tears a fashion plate 
freeing the page. The other is ignored or ripping the sound that cuts through the hushed whispers of the reading room. I tilt my head towards the window and draw a sharp breath. I recognize the clouds that are beginning to darken the city again. The library lamps seem brighter than before. Thunder rumbles in the distance. I shudder. In the cold silence that follows, my breath quickens and shallows. Then the air throbs, electric again, and my pulse quickens at the sight of it, as if that airborne light had imprinted some internal, invisible mark to match my scar. I watch this new light then fall over our city and wonder if it watches me too. As the storm darkens overhead, I begin to fret. I can't let the light pain touch me again. I forced myself to show resilience through the last wound, but I don't feel that I could ever summon that strength again. Better that it would kill me this time, and maybe it will. The thunder grows louder, the sound sickens me. Other women stand at the gate to leave the building, huddling in pairs to make their way to trams. I can't bring myself to walk into the storm, so here I am, facing the sky of fire again. My body trembles, my knees weaken, my vision blurs. I worry that I faint, cause a scene that a library might have caused to lift me and cause passers by to see my scars. A third thunderclap brings a rush of nausea that sends me swiftly out of the reading room, through the hall, past doors to the lending library, the reference library, the newsroom. I lean into the wall, sweat stinging my skin, and then push myself onwards again. The sky beyond the library windows is deepening. Black belly clouds spattering heavy drops. Another flash of lightning, and the wall lamps flicker until even the particles of marble, quartz, and granite embedded in the floor seem to jitter, and I stumble, jarring my shoulder against the door jam. I fall through the bathroom door, crumpling to my knees as everything darkens. Far above, the ground thunder grows louder, deeper. I fall. I fall. When I open my eyes, the red-haired lady stooped over me, hand on my cheek. I lift myself to my elbows and sink back to the floor again. I can't, I can't think of her name. Oh, it's you. What, what, what happened? Seems you keep over by the ups of things. I wasn't sure whether to call for a doctor or her to stay with you. She reaches down and touches my neck where my pulse judders. Her brow ripples with concern. I see blue veins on her wrist, and suddenly I want to press my lips to them to feel the beat of her pulse there. I shock myself with this thought and blush. I blame the lightning. It's erratic, inner flare. It must be turning me crazy. She doesn't remove her hand. She touches my face. I feel my cheek redding under her palm. Let me help, please. I shake my head, try to show myself up again. She leans towards me, extends a hand, but I push it away. Could you give me a moment to collect myself? I'm sure you have more pressing political matters to attend to. I don't mean to be hurt, and yet that is how my voice sounds, simultaneously tremulous and harsh. She takes a step back. Oh, of course, I... But I heard the doors locked some time ago. I didn't want to leave you alone. I go and check for a key downstairs. She stands and steps towards the door, so I steal myself and stand too, leaning into the wall. My hands and knees shake, and the room quivers, all liquid edges. I fall. As I fall, she is by my side, holding my elbow and wrist firmly. She maneuvers me into the hall and gentles me into a chair, one hand still at my arm. The whole room spins. I close my eyes, draw deep breaths, and try to calm my trembling legs. When I open my eyes, she's still holding my wrist, staring at my lightning scarred skin. She lifts my sleeve. I'm sorry, she whispers. How rude of me. You must think me so. And yet, her fingers continue to move over the skin of my wrist. 
tracing the thin tendrils of the scar towards my elbow. Her fingers follow the branching scar, follow the lightning's path through the thin fabric over my back to my neck, behind my ear hole. Her eyes widen. She touches my skin as though it is a map that only she can read. The cartography of an unknown territory to be illuminated. Her touch is electricity and it runs through me like a shock, a static flash, like pure light, a gift of sky. The end.